Well, good morning and welcome to the Kennedy Space Center. It's another great day at America's premier multi-user spaceport as we get ready to make history once again. With the successful test flight of the Crew Dragon on the Falcon 9 that safely delivered Bob Behnken and Doug Hurley to the International Space Station and brought them home safely, it set the stage for the Crew 1 mission tomorrow afternoon. This is the first flight under contract the crew rotation mission with SpaceX to the International Space Station. This is truly a new era of human spaceflight, and I couldn't be more pleased with what the NASA and SpaceX team has accomplished. It's truly an exciting time. It's great that we're flying crews on a regular cadence once again from here at the Kennedy Space Center to space on U.S. rockets. It's also great that we're doing it with our international partners, and we've got Suichi Noguchi from Japan on board. I couldn't be more pleased with what this team has accomplished. I'm truly proud and humbled to be a part of it. It's my pleasure now to introduce our NASA Administrator, Jim Bridenstine. Through his outstanding leadership and advocacy for the commercialization of low Earth orbit, the commercial crew program, and the transformation of the Kennedy Space Center to a multi-user spaceport, have become reality. Please welcome a great American to the stand, our administrator, Jim Bridenstine. Thank you. Well, thank you, Bob, for that introduction, and thank you for your amazing leadership here at the Kennedy Space Center, which has become now a truly multi-user spaceport, and we're looking forward to so many great things happening right here at Kennedy in the years ahead. But yes, this is a, another historic moment uh, it seems like every time I come to Kennedy, we're, we're making history, and this is no different. Uh, the history being made this time is we're launching uh, what we call an operational flight to the International Space Station. Make no mistake, uh, vigilance is always required on every flight. But as Bob said, this is under contract. And another first uh, for NASA is that this flight is certified by the FAA the Federal Aviation Administration. We have Steve Dixon here, and I'll be introducing him here in a few minutes, uh, the administrator of the FAA. But the whole goal here is to commercialize our activities in low Earth orbit. NASA wants to be one customer of many customers in a very robust commercial marketplace for human spaceflight in low Earth orbit. But we don't just want to be one of many customers. We also want to have numerous providers that are competing against each other on cost, on innovation and on safety, ultimately bringing more access to space than ever before. We, of course, have had success with commercial resupply of the International Space Station, where we're buying services to get our equipment and hardware and experiments to the ISS. Now we are having success with commercial crew. Um, and of course, tomorrow's flight is the next major milestone in this development. And of course, the next big phase is commercial space stations themselves where we have private capital and NASA as a customer as well, ultimately capitalizing funding and moving forward for this new era in human spaceflight, uh, where again, NASA is just one of many customers and numerous providers are competing on cost and innovation. The ultimate goal is to have more resources, to do things for which there is not yet a commercial marketplace, like go to the moon and on to Mars under the Artemis program and the moon to Mars program. Uh, that's ultimately what we're, we're trying to achieve here um, and because of what's happening today, all of these things are going to be possible in the future. So this is a, a very exciting time for NASA, um, and, and these are, again, uh, historic firsts. So today's, or tomorrow's launch is licensed by the Federal Aviation Administration. Steve Dixon has become a good friend of mine. He is the administrator of the FAA, and of course, uh, he's a graduate of, of the Air Force Academy, an F-15 pilot by trade who went to work for Delta, flew the line at Delta for nine years. By the way, he got a law degree in the midst of all this. 
Uh, and then, of course, he went into management at Del Delta as the senior vice president of flight operations uh, before taking the helm of the Federal Aviation Administration. So please welcome Steve Dixon to the microphone. Thanks, Jim, and it's really a pleasure. Uh, appreciate your hospitality today at uh, Kennedy Space Center along with Bob. It's an honor to, uh, for the FAA to, to uh, partner with NASA and SpaceX um, on the uh, first operational uh, Crew Dragon launch. You know, this is what happens when you add a drop or two of rocket fuel to ingenuity. Uh, there's tremendous opportunity. We've all dedicated countless hours to making sure this launch is both safe and successful. Uh, the FAA's job uh, in this mission and in commercial space generally is to protect public safety, property, and national security. And we have the right skills and the right workforce and the right team uh, to get this done. We've actually been doing it for many years, but this is our first manned or orbital uh, space flight. So we're really excited and really privileged to be able to participate here today. In calendar year 2020, the FAA has licensed 31 space operations this far, uh, thus far. In fact, we set uh, a record in the month of October with six uh, in one month. And uh, we expect to license 56 more space operations, so just about one a week in uh, 2021. So really an exciting time uh, in aerospace in the United States. In and of themselves, these numbers are very impressive, uh, but they really are just the tip of the iceberg about what's to come. Once space tourism turns the corner, we think we'll see uh, likely topping 100 operations a year. So uh, we are, we are uh, prepared for that. These operations are going to be a huge part of the new space economy, which some estimate, uh, estimates uh, say could be worth a trillion dollars by the year 2040. And it's my job, uh, under the leadership of uh, Transportation Secretary Elaine Chao, to uh, make sure that the U.S. is a doorway, uh, not a barrier, uh, to, the, to, to this innovation. Uh, we recently finalized the Streamline Launch and Recovery Licensing Requirements Rule. The new rule will allow space launch operators to use a single license uh, for multiple launches from multiple launch sites. It strips out uh, very prescriptive requirements and injects flexible uh, performance-based criteria. We told this industry uh, we'd be right out there on the launch pad with them, and we've kept that promise here today. As we've cut red tape, we're also helping to establish our nation's space transportation infrastructure. To date, we've licensed 12 spaceports with several potential sites in the pre-application uh, phase of, for consideration. And we've established an FAA Office of Spaceports that will help us determine what services, rules, and regulation will be needed to support uh, spaceports. And along with this, a whole suite of game-changing technologies and procedures to safely integrate space operations into the national airspace system. By the start of next year, uh, we plan to depo deploy a prototype of the Space Data Integrator, or SDI as we call it, that will feel, uh, feed, uh, feed real-time telemetry data from the space vehicle into the FAA's traffic flow management system so that we can manage air traffic much more surgically than we've been able to do historically. With SDI, we'll be able to block off less airspace for a space operation and release that airspace more quickly so it's available for other airspace users. And to complement SDI, we're already using time-based air traffic procedures to help us better manage the flow of aircraft around a space launch or reentry. This is also, I think, an inspiring time for, uh, for young people as well. We want uh, young people to know uh, what the opportunities are in aerospace and space in particular uh, that can come from a career. And uh, we're working to reach kids of all ages. As a matter of fact, I'm going to be watching uh, tomorrow's launch uh, with a group of kids from Tulsa, Oklahoma, who really uh, have the dream of going to space that's within their reach in ways that it never was for my generation. So I'll just leave you with this. Um, tomorrow's Crew Dragon launch is a great example of American ingenuity, but it's also a tremendous example of uh, global leadership and partnership. But there are even bigger and better days to come. America is watching and the entire world is too. They want to see this industry continue to do great things. And uh, from what I've seen, this industry is stepping up to the task. And to that point, uh, it's my privilege now 
to introduce uh, Hiroshi Sasaki, Sasaki-san, who is the uh, Vice President of JAXA. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Steve, for introducing me. Uh, I'm Hiroshi Sasaki, Vice President of JAXA. Uh, on behalf of all JAXA, uh, I'd like to express the uh, to the uh, NASA and SpaceX staff for the Crew-1 launch operations. Uh, it is a uh, great pleasure for me for uh, the, this uh, exciting missions. And then uh, Soichi Noguchi, Jap Japanese astronaut, is well uh, prepared for the launch. And uh, Japanese uh, experimental module Kibo of ISS is also uh, ready and waiting for the crew arrival. Uh, this mission is a uh, symbol, I think that this mission is symbol of the Japan and the U.S. partnership, and uh, we want to go for, uh, together to the ISS and moon. Yeah. Uh, I'm looking forward to the uh, launch tomorrow, and I wish you a successful launch. Thank you. And I'd like to introduce uh, Sanita Williams, uh, NASA astronaut and uh, very famous even in Japan. <laughs> Thank you, Sasaki-san. It's so great to be here in Florida. I'm so excited to see our friends uh, launch tomorrow, Mike, Victor, Shannon, and Suichi. It's just going to be awesome to see them get to the International Space Station and be up there working for the next six months. You know, the commercial crew program with Boeing and SpaceX has just been spectacular. Spe spectacular. Um, watching the innovation from both companies has been amazing. Um, I'm specifically looking forward to seeing them live up there because uh, our crew, my crew, is going to be the complimentary crew on the Boeing Starliner probably at the end of next year. So um, this is an exciting time for all of us, watching them pave the way so that uh, we, we can do low Earth orbit with commercial crew, and then we can move on to the next big steps. Um, with that, I was, I'm going to introduce one of the newest astronauts in the newest class of astronauts, jo Johnny Kim, who is going to be leading that exploration charge. Thank you. Hi, good morning. I'm, my name is Johnny Kim, and I'm honored and privileged to be here. It's crazy to be uh, thinking about what we're going to be doing tomorrow. It's hard to imagine how far we've come. The first certified flight of a commercial vehicle launching three American astronauts and an inter international partner to the space station. We're here because of the thousands of people who work behind the scenes. We truly stand on the shoulders of giants, from former astronauts to our administrator and our international partners. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for everyone. You've heard of all the benefits that commercial crew program is bringing to the American people, to humanity. But what I'm most excited about is being able to see four of my friends launch on that rocket tomorrow. Their brothers, sisters, parents, children, but they're all humans. And they represent us and everything that we stand for for humanity. And the, success, the successes of the commercial crew program and the ISS, which has been inhabited for 20 years, has set the stage for future space exploration as we go deeper into space, as we return to the moon and beyond. So I am greatly privileged and honored to be here and uh, looking forward to tomorrow. Now, thank you. We'll start taking questions from reporters. Please, one question for a reporter. And we're, our focus is on Crew One. Any question other than Crew One, we'll be happy to take it after this press conference. Our first question. Uh, hello, Marcia Dunn, Associated Press for Mr. Bridenstine. Um, Elon Musk has been tweeting this morning that he's not feeling so good, and some of his COVID tests have come positive, some are negative. What are you, what's he telling you personally, and are you going to allow him to be in launch control or crew quarters even if his next test comes back positive? I mean, negative. negative. Sure, <laughs> sure. So uh, I, I talked to Elon two days ago, 
uh, before this uh, before this news uh, came to be. Um, I'll tell you uh, when somebody tests positive for COVID here at the Kennedy Space Center and across NASA, um, it is our policy for that person to quarantine and self isolate. Um, so we anticipate that that will be taking place. Um, and you know we're looking to SpaceX to do any contract contact tracing that is appropriate. Um, and then of course if if there are changes that need to be made, uh, we will we will look at those. Um, but it's very early right now to, to know if any changes are necessary at this point. Um, we just don't know. Hi, Lauren Gresh with The Verge. My question's for Jim. Um, Crew One comes at a very transitional time for our country. And as we prepare for a new administration, I'm curious, what are your hopes for the commercial crew program, the future of human spaceflight at NASA, and how do you plan to work with any successors that, that to ensure a good future for the program? So when we think about the commercial crew program specifically, and I, I've said this a lot, we are exceptionally grateful to the leadership of, of Charlie Bolden and his commitment going back uh, many years. Um, and then of course, Robert Lightfoot and, and then the leadership that, that I've had. So um, this is a program that um, has, has spanned multiple administrations. And I have always said, and I will continue to advocate for NASA, um, creating sustainable programs. That's, that's what we look for. And that's um, something that I think we are achieving with the Artemis program. Um, we, you know, we have seen now bills in the House and in the Senate receive strong bipartisan support that fund the human landing system for the moon, that fund the Artemis program. And um, the things that we need to do to achieve um, what, what we would say sustainable programs, we're, we're thinking about programs that, that last not just decades, but even a generation. I would like to see you know, a day when my children are my age and we have people living and working on the moon and in fact on Mars. So to achieve that, we're gonna, we're gonna need to have strong apolitical bipartisan support. We have worked for that day in and day out since the day I came to NASA, that was my commitment. Um, and I look, at, I look at what's happening in the House and the Senate and I, I am confident um, that, that we have strong bipartisan support that will result in a sustainable program. Thank you. Hi, this is for Jim, uh, Rachel Joy with Florida Today. Wondering if you could briefly kind of talk about the Falcon 9 engine issue that started with the GPS-3 mission when it had that last second abort and how that played out in terms of engines being swapped out on GPS-3, Crew-1, and Sentinel-6, and how many ultimately are being swapped out across all three rockets. So um, I'll address your, your, your question kind of big picture, but I would refer you, we, we're having a, a flight readiness review, uh, and then we're gonna have a press conference after that, and I would refer those questions to the press conference after the flight readiness review. But I will tell you, when we think about the commercial program itself, and I said this earlier, remember what we're trying to achieve. NASA wants to be one customer of many customers in a very robust commercial marketplace. One of the benefits of that is that when the Air Force or the Space Force or a commercial communication satellite um, launches, we, we're gonna get data and information about the engines on the Falcon 9 rocket, about the performance of the avionics systems, et cetera. And so, and so each one of these missions is actually very informative for what we're trying to achieve as an agency. So that's, that, is, that is, in fact, what, it, what I think is so magnificent about the commercial crew program in general. Um, I, I would say, you know, when we go back to the shuttle era, every flight was a human flight. Um, and every flight was, in fact, a NASA flight. Um, and in this case, we've got commercial flights, as, as Bob Cabana has, has done. He's turned this facility into a multi-user spaceport where we have all of these different entities using these commercial vehicles, including now NASA, so we can get benefits um, from all of these other launches. So I'll leave it at that, but I would refer you, the flight readiness review is, is going to be happening today, and at the conclusion there will be a conference, and certainly that's a question that I would refer to them. Yep. Hi, it's Chris Davenport from the Washington Post for, for Jim. 
Uh, you touched on this in your opening remarks, but there's a lot of talk about this being the beginning of operational flights from U.S. soil, regular flights with crews to the space station. But the fact of the matter is a Crew Dragon's only flown a couple of times. Can you talk, please, a little bit about what you're doing to ensure that it's safe? It seems to me that this is a test mission still in a lot of ways. A absolutely, Chris. So when we think about flights <laughs> to space, um, they, they are all, uh, we, we take all of them with great precaution. We take them very seriously. And, and every bit of attention to detail that we have on a test flight, we also have on operational flights. Um, that being said, I've also said, you know, um, we learn from every single flight, whether it's operational or a test flight. But here's the thing, we're launching four astronauts, three American astronauts, a, a Japanese astronaut. They're going to the International Space Station for a period of six months to do very real and serious work on behalf of the American people and on behalf of humanity at large. Um, and so uh, this, it, it is operational, but it is also true that when you think about space flight, every flight <laughs> is a test flight. Uh, there's always something new and always something different. Uh, in this case, they're going for a longer period of time. They're going to be doing different things on the International Space Station. They're going with a crew of four, and they're going to be doing some different things on the way. And each one of those um, requires us to be exceptionally diligent, which we always are. Uh, but but make, make certain we don't take any of this lightly. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Melanie Holt, WFTV, and this question is for the administrator. I'm just piggybacking on an earlier question, really. We were talking about just the change that is coming now with this administration as well, and I'd like to know if given the opportunity, would you like to continue the work that has already begun here? So um, I will refer you to the, the comments that I made to Irene Klotz, who is standing behind you. <laughs> I made them on Sunday. And I'm going to leave my comments there on that. Thank you. Hi, um, Irene Klotz with Aviation Week. Um, Jim, what is the status of the discussions with the Russians to do crew swaps for commercial crew and Soyuz? So I, I know um, both countries are committed to the International Space Station and the, the amazing work that has been going on there now with humans on board for 20 years. Um, we, you know, we're moving into this new era where instead of NASA, you know, purchasing seats, um, we're, we want to have an exchange of seats where American astronauts can fly on Russian Soyuz rockets and Russian cosmonauts can fly on commercial crew vehicles. Um, that's the direction that, that I think both countries have an interest in achieving. And that's necessary because we want to see a day where if, if there is a challenge with one of the vehicles and it's down for a period of time, uh, we have continual access to the International Space Station by both partners. Um, so, so those discussions are ongoing. Um, we don't have a resolution at this point, but certainly that's something both countries are working towards. I could ask a second question of uh, Mr. Dixon. Is uh, the process that you just went through to certify this mission, how similar will that be when you're asked to certify flights with non-professional astronauts? Uh, it's a great question. It'll, it'll be very, uh, really the same process, uh, and it's very similar to the process that we've been using uh, for many years on unmanned commercial missions. Uh, I think that, uh, though, to Jim's point about sustainable programs, the FAA being involved in this is part of scaling uh, uh, manned commercial uh, space missions uh, in a larger in a larger way because they'll become a more uh, routine. Uh, part of the uh, aerospace system uh, in our country. So, again, it's it's really building on the work that we've all done together. Uh, NASA and the FAA have partnered on many issues over the years, and this is just another form of that partnership. Thanks. Hi, Stephen Clark from Space Flight Now. Uh, if I could ask two, please. First, for Administrator Brinstein. Um, wanted to get your response to the uh, appropriations bill in the Senate that. Uh, provides about a billion dollars to the HLS program, uh, less than a third of what the administration requested, um, a little bit more than the House version, but, but, uh, but uh, not as much as you requested. Just wanted to see how, how that whole process is going to affect the HLS procurement and, uh, and 2024 for Artemis. And for Sonny Williams, um, 
what's the latest you're hearing from your, the Boeing team on Starliner and uh, when those test flights may be, uh, you know, OFT2 uh, crew flight test and when you're going to fly and, and uh, what's uh, driving the schedule right now? Thank you. Great questions both. I'll tell you, um, when it comes to the bills that we've seen in the House and the Senate, first of all, we currently have enacted a $600 million appropriation for a human landing system, which was done with bipartisan support in both the House and the Senate, and has now resulted in three contractors um, being contracted to develop the human landing system. So that, I want to be clear, that is something that has not happened since 1972. So we are exceptionally grateful for where we are right now because of the bipartisan support we've had from the House and the Senate. Um, and I would say when we look at what, you know, what we're looking for for 2021, um, number one, the House has again passed a bipartisan bill that funds a human landing system at $600 million. The Senate um, has passed a human landing, or they haven't passed it, but they have, they have now presented a bill that has the human landing system funded at $1 billion. Um, again, strong bipartisan support in both chambers, very, very positive for the creation of a sustainable program, which of course is our highest priority. We've been through times in the past, the vision for space exploration, where we have plans to go to the moon and they get canceled, the space exploration initiative, we have plans to go to the moon and they get canceled. That's why this bipartisan apolitical support is so important. And, and I'll tell you, I'm very grateful for the fact that as hard as we have worked to achieve it, we now have that. Now, is it everything that we requested in the budget request? The answer is no, and you know that. Um, but I will also tell you that the process is ongoing. Uh, there's a bill in the House. There's now a bill in the Senate. They're going to have to be conferenced. There's going to be discussions with the White House. And, and, um, and I think, you know, at the end, um, we would like to see the full amount funded. But I will also say it is critically important to recognize the strong apolitical bipartisan support for the human landing system and the Artemis program in general. Yeah, a quick note on Starliner. It, you know, it's an amazing vehicle. It's great. We've got two of them that we're going to be flying, and uh, we're making sure all the T's are crossed, all the I's are dotted. And the next spacecraft to go up to OFT2 will be ready essentially for people to be on board. So it's a little bit different from OFT1 where we didn't have all of the systems in place. So it's a little bit more diligent that we're working on the spacecraft. End of this year, beginning of next year, we should have OFT2, CFT, uh, not too long after that, ready to follow probably by springtime. And um, um, knock on wood, I'm hoping me and my crew will be ready to go by the end of next year. Uh, it's going to be an exciting year. with. You know, we also have to worry about what ports are open on the space station. You know, it's getting a little crowded in space, and that's a, a really good thing, and we're just going to have to work into the schedule. So uh, uh, stand by. It's going to be before you know it. This question is for the administrator, Gio Benitez with ABC News. Uh, Mr. Administrator, we've talked about this before, and I know it's not lost on you that these historic launches are happening in the midst of a global pandemic. So with, you could even argue that more people are suffering now than they were in May when we saw that other launch. How do you convince the American people that this is an important mission that needs to happen right now? Well, it, it really is an important mission. I mean, you look at the work that's happening that's going to be beneficial for humanity. And I'll, I'll just give you a sum that are, that are, that are you know, very salient right now. We are advancing you know, medicine using the microgravity of space in ways that you cannot do here in the gravity well of Earth, compounding pharmaceuticals. Um, we are advancing immunizations, and the, the, the two that I talk about the most are salmonella and pneumonia. Immunizations, uh, immunization capabilities that have been advanced using the microgravity of space that have had transformational impacts for life here on Earth. But of course, you know, we're talking about four astronauts going to the International Space Station. The amount of research that we can get given the complement on the International Space Station right now is good. When we have additional astronauts, a full complement of crew on the International Space Station, the amount of research is going to be transformational. And so it is critically important as we advance the human condition here on Earth, whether we're, you know, we, we talk about creating uh, human tissue in the microgravity of space where it doesn't go flat like it does in the gravity well of Earth. Um, that human tissue is regenerative in nature and it can be used uh, to, 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 to maybe save lives one day. So these are the kind of technologies when we talk about industrialized biomedicine that are happening on the International Space Station right now. 
that may relate to this pandemic, that may relate to the next pandemic, that may relate to people um, right now that have macular degeneration. We're, we're creating uh, artificial retinas for the human eyeball on the International Space Station using advanced materials, not biomedicine, but advanced materials. So these are the kind of things that are transformational for life on Earth. Um, and, and we believe that it's critically important. I also want to give compliments to Bob uh, Cabana, uh, shuttle astronaut, four missions, um, who has done great work as the leader of this center. Um, we have had cases at the center, but, but the amount, but it's not, it's, we're, people aren't getting it here. They're getting it other places because of the protocols Bob has put in place and the adherence, uh, the great workforce here at Kennedy, the adherence to those protocols, social distancing, mask wearing. Um, if you don't need to come to work, uh, if you can do your work from home, do it from home. These are the protocols uh, that we've put in place here at Kennedy. Bob has led the effort and there's been a lot of success. Um, so we, we need that to continue. But, but I feel good about where we are and I think uh, the American people do as well. Thank you. Hi, Ken Kramer, Space Up Close. Uh, thank you for doing this. And uh, Jim, I want to say thank you for being a great administrator. You've really motivated everybody and excited everybody with Artemis, just like uh, the FAA gentleman, exciting the kids. It's so, so important. We've been waiting decades to go back to the moon. So thank you for your impetus and in your team and getting that done, okay? So my question is also about Artemis. Um, we've had a lot of hurricanes in, uh, in, uh, in the Gulf very near and passing over uh, the, uh, the core stage. How, how is the core stage doing? How are NASA facilities doing there in uh, Stennis and Michoud? Well, for, for sure, um, the, there have been impacts uh, from hurricanes and, of course, from COVID. Um, and, and people are aware that the, the core stage of the SLS, I mean, that's the challenge right now. We've got to get that complete. We've got to get the green run test uh, complete. Um, and, and we're working on that every day. Um, and the reason we do the green run test, we go through every system and every subsystem and, and, and we test all of the limits to make sure all of the margin is, and we're going to find things. And when we find things, we're going to get them corrected. Remember, the SLS rocket is not, it, it, uh, it is a test vehicle, but it's going to the moon. Uh, that rocket is going to fly to the moon. Well, I'll say this, it's going to launch Orion and the European service module to the moon. Um, and, and so we have to make sure we get it right. And if, when we get this first one right, uh, you know, the second SLS is going to launch American astronauts around the moon. So, uh, so this, is a, this is a program that, uh, that is on the five-yard line, and we're very excited about getting the test complete, getting the core stage here. You know, yesterday I was at the VAB, the, the Vehicle Assembly Building, um, and the solid rocket boosters are there, ready to, to be integrated. They're not in the vehicle assembly building now, but they're in the processing facility. But they're here at Kennedy. Um, you know, we, we saw, you know, the Orion crew capsule is ready and tested. The European service module is ready and tested. Uh, the adapters and the fairings, everything is ready. We just got to get that core stage here. The, uh, you know, we saw just recently the, the mobile launcher roll out and then roll back in. And uh, yesterday I saw it in its completed form. And it's beautiful. Bob told me that would not that would not be what holds us up, and so far he's been right. So, um, so there's a, there's a lot of positive things happening, and uh, we're very excited about getting that first launch done. Um, at, as of this point, the November date of 2021 for that first launch has not changed. We had margin in that schedule, um, but I will also tell you that uh, that with COVID and the hurricanes and some other things, that margin is is gonna is gonna slip. So. Uh, right now, we're holding to that schedule. Is that going to stay that way? It depends. I mean, as, as time goes on, we're going we're gonna to learn more about how these impacts are affecting us. Thanks. Thank can, can I ask one more question about COVID? If there's any research on the ISS directed towards COVID, or have you been contacted by the vaccine companies at all to, to the, where the ISS could assist in that research? Thanks. Uh, not, not on the vaccines per se, but I will tell you, you know, when, 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 when the pandemic first began, we had great, great folks at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which is one of the NASA centers at, at Caltech University. Um, and and they, when, they, when they had to stop work on some projects because of COVID, they went to work in their own homes and they created a ventilator that uses none of the parts that come from the other you know, ventilator manufacturing capabilities. That ventilator 
has now been licensed to a number of companies for mass manufacturing if and when needed. Um, I will tell you that the way we, the way we, um, the way we make sure that we protect planets when we fly robots to other worlds, uh, that's basically with a fog, and, and we make sure that we don't take any microbes to any other worlds. Well, that, that fog actually kills viruses as well. Um, and and, and, that, and we, have, we have now um, partnered with uh, a company in, in Ohio uh, to use that fog to clean the inside of ambulances, and now it's going to be scaled up to clean the inside of classrooms and businesses and you know, you name it, any, any closed space. Um, so that there are great things that are happening at NASA that support the COVID response. Uh, but as far as any immunization capability at this point, uh, if there is, I have not heard of it at this point. Thank you. Hello and konnichiwa. <laughs> Phil Keating, Fox News. Uh, one question, as the rules imply, uh, but kind of two parts. Have any technical issues at all uh, arisen on Launchpad 39 with the Crew-1 stack and after the splashdown of Demo-2 and all the analysis post-splashdown, was it basically concluded that was a flawless launch and mission? I'll, I'll identify two issues that, that we took up and, and dealt with, and, and then I'll turn it over to Bob regarding the launch pad itself. Um, so when, when, the, when, the, when the capsule came back, um, it looked like the ablative heat shield uh, had some spots where it may have ablated more than we anticipated, within limits, within margin, uh, but, but, but more than we anticipated. And of course, uh, the good thing, again, about commercial crew and commercial resupply is that that we've tested a lot of heat shields and we've seen a lot of, a lot of heat shields. Now, um, we, we've made adjustments to the heat shield to, to ensure that, 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 we, that we understood what the issue was and, and, and fixed it. Um, and then there was an issue on the parachute uh, where uh, they opened uh, maybe a, a fraction of a second uh, later than we anticipated, all within margin, I wanna be very clear, all within what was specified as far as the, the realm of safety. Um, but it, it might have taken just a little bit longer for those parachutes to deploy, so I think they deployed um, at around 6,000 feet instead of 6,500 or whatever the number was. Um, but, uh, but those are two issues that have been resolved. Um, again, I want to be clear, uh, they were within margin and safe. Uh, we just wanted to understand it a little bit more, make some adjustments, and we did. Uh, as far as the pad, I'll turn it over to Bob. So the pad's ready to go. But after every launch, uh, regardless of what pad it is, there are, there are maintenance procedures that have to be followed to inspect the pad, go back and correct some things that may have been damaged, but to ensure that the pad's ready for the next launch. And that, that goes for any pad out here. So SpaceX went through everything after every launch, and they're good to go. Yeah, I wasn't really re referring to the pad itself, but uh, the capsule and the rocket stack as we approach launch tomorrow night. Yeah, right now, uh, as the administrator said, we're going to have our launch readiness review with SpaceX here at noon, and uh, we'll find out the latest detail on everything. Up until now, as far as I know, they're working no uh, serious issues, and uh, we're good to go, but we'll have the details after the launch readiness review at noon. Good morning. This is Takuya Katsumura from Japan's Nippon Television. This is a question for Mr. Bridenstine. So tomorrow is going to be a, a historical operational flight of crew one where uh soichi noguchi will be flying alongside uh, american astronauts wh how significant how, how significant it is and what's the meaning of it for uh, nasa as well as for uh, jaxa yeah no it, it is extremely significant soichi noguchi is an amazing astronaut he's an amazing human being um, and he's not just a japanese hero he's an american hero i think he is uh he is one of the finest um I will tell you, uh, you know, when we think about the partnerships that we have around the world, Japan is among the best partners that we have. Um, and I will also say that the significance of that partnership is here we are on, on the first operational mission of, of a commercial crew vehicle, and Japan is with us. Really on day one, Japan is with us, with us on the International Space Station. We're looking at the enthusiasm in Japan for the Artemis program. Um, and and, and the, the, the budget that Japan is seeking um, to achieve uh, humans landing on the moon, 
uh, for the first time since 1972 and knowing that Japan wants to be with us on the Artemis program um, and committing themselves not just to the effort but backing it up with financial resources. Uh, Japan is an amazing partner and we're very, very grateful for, for the nation of Japan. And, um, and I look forward to all the amazing things that Suichi Noguchi is going to do on the International Space Station over the coming six months. Uh, so he is, a, he is a special individual, and, uh, and we look forward to uh, a long and strong partnership with Japan as we continue. This will be our last question. Administrator David Curley from Discovery Channel. About Elon Musk uh, and the possibility that uh, he's not feeling good and could be ill. I know the crew is in quarantine. Has he had any contact with the crew or others trainers or others who've been in contact with the crew, have you been able to contact Trace all that? And if not, is there a chance that if he is ill, you might have to delay? So as far as any contact with the crew, I am unaware of it. Uh, that contact tracing should be underway right now. Um, and, and, and of course, NASA and SpaceX are going to work through it together um, and come to the right, the right conclusion. Um, but look, th this news just broke before this press conference. so. Um, look, if there are adjustments that need to be made, we will make them. I will tell you, our astronauts have been in quarantine for weeks, um, and they should not have had contact with anybody. Um, they, 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 should have, they should be in good shape. All right. But there is a chance you could delay if there is a contact trace that gets back to the crew. I don't know that. I don't, I don't, I, I'm not going to say that. Um, w there's a lot to learn. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you so much. We'll close out the press conference with final remarks from the administrator. Okay. Well, I just want to thank everybody for once again coming to a launch. Uh, this time, uh, really uh, the first time we go with a crew of four to the International Space Station on a commercial crew vehicle. It's the first time we go with one of our international partners, Japan. And we are so very grateful for the amazing partnership that we have with Japan. Um, and it's the first time we go as a commercial vehicle licensed uh, with, uh, with humans into orbit, licensed by the FAA. So there's a lot of firsts on this flight, a lot of amazing discoveries that are going to happen by these four amazing astronauts over the next uh, six months. So um, it's a great time uh, to be at NASA, and it's a great time uh, if you're an enthusiast uh, of, of space exploration. Um, boy, I'll there's a lot happening now, not just in low Earth orbit, uh, but with the Artemis program and all the way to the moon. So thank you all for being in attendance, and we'll look forward to a great launch tomorrow. Thank you.